the radio. Uh, I'm here to introduce our next speaker, Alexei ooh, Oknov. I think I did that right. Please correct me, Alexei. Um, he's the founder and lead of the TurboGeth client. He leads research critical for the future of Ethereum. And today he's going to talk to us a little bit about how modular development will enable more people to be involved in the ETH1 core development. So without further ado, please take it away. Um, I... Hello, Emily. Thank you for introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so let's uh, get straight into this. Um, so I prepared a little presentation. It will be shorter than the last time, uh, but I need to just just click a couple of buttons. One sec. Um, where's it? Um, sorry, I am a bit disoriented. Yeah, that's here. Okay. Um, okay. So the so what I'm going to be talking about here is that, um, so I've started, uh, let's see, Let me, just one second, okay. So I've started watching um, Ethereum core development uh, uh, somewhere uh, maybe in the beginning of 2018, and it took me a while to really understand what's going on. And uh, I remember um, we had some kind of, uh, gathering or summit in Stanford in, in the beginning of 2019. And uh, you're kind of walking around the campus, Stanford campus was a great place. And somebody just asked me the question without any kind of, uh, without, without any sort of irony or sar sarcasm, like, so how does um, a particular change get uh, into Ethereum? Like, how does it work? And then I stopped and thought about it. And of course, the prepared answer would be like, oh, there's this a process, there's EIPs, and you need to do this and that, you need to go through the stages. But I actually, I tried to describe what, what, happens re, what, what happens in reality. So not just as a process tells us, but what actually happens. And it sort of started, led me onto this path of thinking about it a bit more. And I kept uh, coming back to the same um, uh, realization that we are seriously bottlenecked on the, um, the core developers. And it, it was obvious to pretty much everybody that we have a very smaller number of people that are involved into the most critical part of this process. And there doesn't matter how many people will be throwing in the EIPs and, and kind of coming up with the interesting kind of ideas, but eventually all this thing, all this deluge of stuff needs to get through a very small number of people. Um, and the reason for that is because these people are what you would call the owners of the code. And that's, I think it's understandable that if you own this code, it's not like you're, um, it's not like you're, in, not in the sense that, you know, it belongs to you, but in the sense that you are responsible and accountable well, you feel that you're accountable to, for the, responsible for the quality. So if, uh, if somebody gives you the change and you didn't verify it yourself, you are basically feeling that, well, that might break. I still, I need at least to test it myself. So I can tell you, for example, that in our project, I do quite a lot of testing. You know, you would not, you might not expect that, but I actually spend a lot of my time testing what other people have written because I, I feel that I'm, I have an ownership and I need to make sure that the, I, I, the, any critical, any serious problems don't just pass, uh, pass through. So, and I also understand that some people might, other people might not completely get all the uh, nuances and, and I need to basically do all the testing. And so that applies to other core developers as well. So who, took, who take their job seriously and they do need to look at everything and they need to try to understand everything. And then sometimes or oftentimes that causes some frustration uh, from the people who propose things. And so, and I was trying to propose, like figure out how are we gonna solve this? You know, there must be a way to, uh, to, uh, to widen this bottleneck, to get more people in, but without sacrificing the quality. And back in 2019, so there was this idea about uh, the working groups and things like this. And uh, yeah, I wrote the blog post about it, but then after a while I realized it didn't quite work. Um, and the, the learnings from there was that the working groups that we created back then, they didn't own any code. So, uh, so they could basically do research and they could prepare some changes, uh, this and that, but because they didn't own the code, 
all these changes still had to go through the, the developers who did own the code and they had to apply their own rigorous um, you know, checking, testing process and things before changes go in. Um, and then, then another realization is that most of the Ethereum core developers is not implementing EIPs, it's something very different. It's again, it's a lot of testing. It's a lot of, uh, some, a lot of people defuzzing. It's a lot of um, uh, in, like uh, figuring out the performance improvements, which uh, most of them don't have nothing to do with the IPs. Uh, so that's another thing I, I realized. So that's uh, the, that view that the core developers are the people who implement the IPs are, it's, it's actually not adequate. And there's a lots of other nuances. So, and so then uh, we uh, zoom in, so scroll into uh, 2020, and some of you might might, might have uh, seen, we had about three all core dev calls, uh, which I, I put on a, uh, on a slide, like when they happen, you can go and ba go back and, and, and watch them or listen to them. And so we spent these three calls where we decided we're not going to talk about the IPs, but we're going to be talking about other issues. And three main issues that I put highlight here is the burnout of the core developers, which is, I think is the consequence of these uh, sort of responsibilities that I talked uh, about in the first slide. And, you know, the pressure that, you know, they feel on themselves um, and the, the pressure also combined with the pressure uh, coming from other people who want something to be changed, but that, uh, you know, that kind of double pressure from one from within and one from, from, from the outside. And not many people, not, not uh, everybody can deal with that. Uh, uh, so then um, we were talked about diversity of different implementations and we also talked about um, the barrier to entry. So this is the secondary issues where that like is, we recognize that it's very difficult for anybody new to come in and just uh, let's say produce a new implementation. Um, so, you know, I kept thinking about those things. I mean, we did uh, discover quite an interesting thought. Um, and then uh, I went on, uh, I went ahead and I tried to find the solution. So my solution that I already proposed on these calls, which some people were skeptical about, but some people were supportive, is essentially uh, introducing modularity. And it's actually something that I and my team can do, uh, can action rather than simply propose and, you know, try to push for. So we can actually do that. Before we talk about modularity, let's just quickly go into um, the, so on these calls, one of the theme was that we do need a diversity of implementations uh, for this reason that if we have only, um, so if we have basically the, the dominant implementation that there might be some um, some bug happening and that bug is uh, is essentially becomes the part, becomes of the rules of the protocol, which from my point of view, sometimes it's okay, it's permissible um, if you can, you know, because that's already actually been done uh, a couple of times. Um, but if we look at the uh, the different implementations disagreeing about uh, the the state, what what people come call consensus failures, it's actually it's a sort of this is a presented as the sort of the the scariest thing, one of the scariest thing that could happen on the on the Ethereum network, consensus failure. So if we look, I mean that, that is my own observation because I do look at the to the past, but I didn't like take the statistical analysis of this. It does happen quite rarely, but it does happen both on mainnet on, on on test nets. And so my observation is that most consensus failures are actually happen in one specific place of the Ethereum implementation. And that's what I put here in the diagram. So what I call the interblock state. So it's not actually EVM itself. Most of the time EVM isn't uh, generating consensus failure. It's a, sort of a layer around it, which deals with the things like um, caching the the, the things that retrieved from the database, it's the refund logic, it's the uh, self-destruction uh, logic and things like this. So they are not strictly, I mean, depending what you think EVM is, but they're, for example, if you look at EVMC, which is the very popular, well, very popular interface for uh, written in C, for example, EVMC is, uh, if, you, if you look at my diagram, you would see that EVMC is actually interface between um, that EVM block and that uh, like a pink block of the interblock set. So this is the EVMC, which is uh, 
which is this boundary. And then within this boundary, for example, uh, we're going to be talking about EVM1, which is one of the implementation. It implements this, but it does not implement that pink thing, which is, needs to be wrapped around it. So, and I pose it that this is where most of the consensus failures happen, not in here, not in the peer-to-peer -to -peer things, not in the Merkleization, not in the state reader or anything. It's actually mostly there. And that would be important for my next uh, couple of slide. So what we already did, uh, so as I said that I, we started to take action on this. I mean, we've been doing this uh, for, for quite a long time. So what we actually did um, since May, we have started uh, so we have Turbogeth, of course, and that is the, the derivative of uh, Go Ethereum. And we've replaced quite a lot of things in Go Ethereum, but I think we still have a virtual machine that's pretty much unchanged, uh, which is inherited from uh, Go Ethereum. We have changed the interblock state pretty uh, quite a lot, so it, it's, it's very different. So that's why I'm saying TG here. Um, but we also already produced the alternative implementation of these uh, piece that where the most consensus problems happen. And this is completely clean room implementation. So there was no cold lifting from anywhere. Uh, we did not re-implement the EVM, we just took the EVM one, which has been written by other people. And currently it works actually, it works better than uh, this one. So, so currently the, 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 the recent benchmark was that we could run this uh, this bit through the all the Ethereum blocks in about 36 hours. And we can run this through the same time blocks in 21 and a half hours, which is pretty good improvement. But what I'm go was gonna say in this diagram is that, you know, if you look at those things that they have um, completely different implementation of the most uh, of the part which generates most consensus failures. So for the, in, for this kind of purpose, these could be deemed as a, as, a, as a different implementations and they would provide the diversity if you run, uh, let's say, if you run uh, Turbogeth in these two different configurations. So by the way, we did not finish the integration of the silkworm thing into Turbogeth, but I think we, we will uh, finish this quite soon. So next thing we did is that um, uh, we, are, we started on the path of the modularization uh, um, and uh, taking out components. And that was one of the first things we did. Um, we did it for the purpose of performance because we noticed that um, the RPC requests, they, um, they do tend to be quite uh, CPU intensive. Um, I think it's because uh, mostly because of the uh, uh, transformations of data between formats and stuff like this. So what we did, we separated them into different uh, processes and uh, we have uh, created the sort of very simple interface, uh, very low level interface between the RPC daemon and, and, and the node. Um, and that, that uh, also has an interesting um, uh, consequence that there, might, there could be multiple RPC daemons, uh, for example, implementing different variations of the uh, RPC, uh, JSON RPC standards. They could reside on, on the same machine or different machines. Um, so currently we are only, there's, um, it works with the TCP IP here. Uh, but actually, we are we realized that we can also make it work with a shared memory. So if you need the, if the, if you can put them on the same machine and the um, your you need the really high performance, you can do that. It doesn't quite work yet. We we just need to fix it. But it it could work in 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 principle. But this is where it all kind of started. So this is by the way um, for the um, communication between the, the 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 protocols. Our current standard we just basically do it for all the components. If we want to separate them, we use gRPC, which is basically HTTP2 based uh, um, pro sort of framework, uh, which is based on protobuf. And it, it, you can generate bindings for pretty much any language uh, in existence. So we, for example, this is like a protocol definition for our RPC daemon. As you can see that what it does, it's basically, it's like a, it, it's like a database. You can open a course or to the, you can open a transaction and then you can, you know, inside the transaction, you can open a cursor to a table, and then you just do um, uh, basically extract the go first, you go to the first record, you can seek something in the database and you can retrieve it. And it has a, have all the semantics of prefetch and everything like this. But the, the point is that the interface is very universal and simple. So you can implement pretty much any RPC request using that because what you are given is the remote database access. And so that basically was the first thing. And then uh, that gave us idea to that we can actually, uh, then next thing um, 
whenever we had this uh, issues of um, where we wanted to do some variations, uh, we okay, we, we said we can uh, split these things as a component. So the work currently ongoing on the consensus engine split, and this is actually quite an important one. So currently, uh, although people say that the consensus engine is pluggable, but actually it's not quite pluggable because it still uh, lives inside the, the um, it basically lives inside the code of the implementation. And anything that lives inside the code of implementation has to be verified, as I mentioned before, by the code owner. It has to be like checked and everything. But if imagine instead you had the consensus engines implemented as a component with a well-defined interface, then the people who develop the consensus engines could own that code. And so that could be already a start of separation of the code ownership. And so the, if let's say, if that was a working group that worked on the consensus engines, that working group not only just proposed something, but they could actually own the code, they can do their own releases, as long as they, you know, there, there's a compatibility through the interface. And then the sort of, it's one of the examples where the core developers essentially give up the, um, the responsibility and the power they need to come at the same time so that they don't own this code anymore, but they own the, their implementation of the interface. So the switch to different consensus engine can happen uh, already with the participation of a different group. And so that's uh, currently we're still figuring out the first version of the interface, because in this interface, uh, we're trying to support um, three things already, the already existing ones that we know about. We are trying to support ET hash, which is quite simple. So in ET hash, you would have, let's say, the, these things that are, are marked green, like, um, you know, uh, the core wants to verify a certain header, it just sends it to the consensus, and there's a bit of chatter going on between them. Uh, but in the end, it gets the result, whether it's verified or not. Um, so the consensus can ask for additional information, for example, for some parent blocks and uh, for parent headers and stuff like this. And uh, but then another use case is when uh, the core uh, wants to do fork choice. So, and again, the fork choice rule is the is the, the job of consensus engine. So it will ask out of these set of headers, which one is the best? And the consensus engine will say this, it will say this one. And it can, again, it, it can ask for some additional information. For example, um, if, there, it's, if these things are actually on a different forks, it will ask for the predecessors of these headers to arrive at the common ancestor and it will, then it will be able to figure out, for example, what's the, the highest difficulty or whatever a consensus algorithm says. Um, and then for the ceiling is like, it's for the miners or for validators, there's another request. But we also, so we're looking at the ET hash, we're looking at the click, uh, click could be implemented with this protocol as well. And we also look at an aura, but aura is the most complicated one. Uh, but we actually are probably gonna try to implement this. Anyways, so next um, practical example is the P2P Sentry. This is also a work in progress and it's a bit further ahead than, than, uh, uh, than Consensus Engine. We actually have uh, initial implementations running. And uh, one thing to notice here is that we already have two implementations of Sentry, one in, uh, which is we basically separated the code, the peer-to-peer -peer code that uh, existed in Trubergef, which was inherited from Go Ethereum. And so literally like today I was testing it as, the, as a sentry. And then we have another sentry written in Rust, um, um, which is basically completely clean room implementation. And they are implement the, the very similar protocol. And so I'm not gonna go into details, but this is the protocol we're currently working around. So what we're trying to do is that we're trying to sort of make these two sentries are essentially pluggable or even another interesting thing you can do is that you can actually have multiple sentries connected to the same node. And with all of the other, um, yeah, so this is actually opens up some more interesting uh, uh, flexible um, options because you can have like, a, yeah, you can have a two different sentries of different implementations connected just in case one of them has a bug, then you still um, actually connect it through another one. So, so here basically the idea is that the diversity could come in many forms. It doesn't have to be the entire re-implementation of the, of the uh, client, but it could be a re-implementation of a specific bit, or you, you could actually have multiple implementation in one installation, like with an example of sentries. And the last bit uh, that I'm gonna show 
is the uh, transaction pool split, which we haven't started yet, but we are going to start it very soon with some help uh, from other people. And you probably, some of you might have watched the uh, today's talk about account abstraction. So for example, the work on account abstraction requires a lot of um, changes inside the transaction pool logic and how we going to, you know, how I propose we're gonna do it. So first of all, we're going to lift it out of the core uh, component. And as you can see here, it could be done uh, with the help of a peer to -peer, sent peer to peer sentry. So essentially the transaction pool becomes this kind of component suspended on the two interfaces. Uh, so um, from on one hand, it, it's interfacing with the P2P sentry for the transaction traffic. And on the other hand, it does require some access to the state, but it can use the same interface that RPC daemon is using for the state because it can basically query the database. And what is interesting here is that, um, you know, I'm, I predict that there will be multiple different implementations of transaction pool, uh, some for the purposes of the account obstruction experiments, some of the pur pur purposes of some sort of MEV experiments um, and so forth. Uh, we also have a project uh, to try to implement it in a different language. I think we're, we're going to try to do it in Python, for example, like, you know, how cool is that? You can implement transaction pool in Python com connected to our Sentry, which is written in Rust and to the TurboGuess node, which is written in Go and it's all gonna work. Um, so yeah, as a conclusion uh, to underscore uh, score the things I just said that you know we need to think about implementation diversity in a very in a, I would say more diverse way so it could actually come in different forms it could be uh, not just a basically just re reproduce the the whole thing in a different way but maybe reproduce the parts in a um, in a different way and also kind of recombine them um, another thing is that working group can and should own the code and that would um, make them because they are the owners they will be responsible for code quality and this is how we're going to widen the bottleneck and another thought is that for everybody innovation always happens elsewhere we are not the smartest people in on the on the planet right there will always be people who are smarter than us that will come and you know help us to uh you know to do things better yeah that's uh that's it Awesome. Thank you so much, Alexei, for sharing that with us. Um, if you've got time to hang out for a little bit, I do have a couple questions that came in from the chat. Um, the first question is, how big is the performance overhead for decoupling via JSON RPC? Um, we actually haven't measured that, uh, to be honest. Uh, we did have a project to measure this uh, some time ago, but it was a long time ago. And we, we only saw the overhead on the things that are, they were really, really intense uh, kind of chatter with the database. Uh, I think we were testing something like get storage range at, and it was some uh, um, uh, considerable overhead. However, if we look at the current usage of uh, RPC requests in, in Fewer, for example, they uh, had a blog post recently that the, one of the most popular requests is East call, which is essentially executing transactions uh, you know, onto the state, which is in, in um, which is current current state or something, and so this is where I expect a lot of benefits from taking that out of the node because you will uh, run EVM in the RPC daemon, not in a node, and it will just uh, once in a while go into a node to ask for a state. So yeah, uh, the, the answer is I don't know, but uh, as I said as well, we also introduce in the uh, the the mode where you can do shared memory with the with the node. And actually, I think in this case, the performance might not be even um, different. Awesome. Right. Um, got a couple more questions. Okay. Uh, next one, is it, I'm gonna mispronounce this, I know it. Is it possible to use C++ Silkworm EVMONE already? This particular user um, would love to add it to their fuzzing efforts. Yeah, so the Silkworm is open source and it's, uh, it's got Apache 2 license, so uh, you can search for it. Um, I mean, or, or yeah, I think there are also links from the, from the TurboGet repository, definitely. I mean, open source, Apache license, I mean, it's just out of the oven. Uh, so, you know, it's not like uh, we're, we haven't uh, did that a lot of testing with it, but if they want to experiment, yeah, you know, be my guest. All right, cool, <laughs> cool. All right, let me check on the chat. Got another one. Okay. Will this 
modular, will this modularization stay in TurboGeth because there's more freedom to design or have other clients expressed an interest in adopting this approach? Um, I sort of like, uh, yes and no, because I think uh, at the moment, uh, this is very new, um, a kind of new direction. And I, I, some people are still skeptical about this. Um, and my sort of way to go about it is that I, we will essentially just do it. We will not try to sort of, uh, to, to, to try to like get the, to, to try to basically do consensus on this before we, we actually just gonna prototype. And we will see if this brings some benefits. And if it does, I'm sure other people will join and people will recognize that if somebody tries, will try to come in and uh, re-implement uh, TurboGeth, for example, or any other client, it, might, it will be much easier for them to start with the one component and then get to another component and another one. So they can, you know, the job that I was doing for the last uh, almost three years would be much easier if I just had some small part to start with rather than the, this looking at this whole thing. I'm sure that there, there will be a lot of uh, cooperation. Got it. Got it. All right, I'm gonna hang on just for like one half a minute to see if we have any more questions because mm -hmm. the chat does seem to be pretty active. Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay, I think that's it. Um, thank you, Alexei, for joining us, giving us an awesome yeah. talk. Um, I'm sure I'll see you around. Okay, bye. bye. Bye.